Good everything. Hi, good good morning, Dr. Carl. Hello. Good, good morning, Professor Hunter. How are you? I'm good. You know, um, I, I wanted to start with actually that wasn't funny now that I look at it. You know, Richard Pryor, one of his iconic live on the sunset strip, uh, one of the best, I think, comedy uh live specials ever iconic um describing his battle with uh the pipe with drugs and jim brown showing up for him jim brown made transition yesterday showing up for him do you want to what you gonna do you gonna keep doing this or you gonna end our friendship but that he showed up you know um it's gonna be a lot of discussion about jim brown uh a lot of discussion about uh women being thrown off of balconies, rape at the Playboy Mansion. There's going to be some discussion of that. There's going to be the iconic picture of him and uh, Bill Russell uh, flanking Muhammad Ali. Uh, when Muhammad, yes, okay, yes, that that picture right there. Um, yeah. It's going to be a lot of talk about, you know, uh, Raquel Welch, maybe, football, lacrosse. Maybe there's going to be a lot of talk. But who is he to us, you know? And is that a social structure or a governance structure discussion? Well, what do you think? I don't, you know, I'm, I'm, yeah. You know, I, I just got, I just got introduced to the difference, you know, three years ago in class. Oh, we've been living the difference our whole lives. All <laughs> <of us. laughs> how we live in these two worlds, and maybe it's more than two worlds for some of us, right? And how we have to contort and navigate these spaces have heroes that are complicated because aren't all people uh flawed and complicated and, and yeah beyond the crime beyond the abuse or whatever um there's still like do we throw away the baby with the bath water and i think you know as black people we never have you know we've always left space to deal with the complicated among us and still elevate the things that uh that they did that were were good we we're, were able to chew up the meat and spit out the bones which is uh, something i always encourage people to do because i don't want to lose the good morsels while while we examine the things that could choke us you know could get caught in our throat um and we talked about this with one night in miami uh during the pandemic you and i had that yeah. conversation we most uh, certainly did y'all go back and archive and watch that cuz we did talk ex extensively about that yeah so, so where where are we today as Jim Brown makes transition and as and, and it's weird too because I always say some people had they died 20 years ago, none of this would be, you know, like Bill Cosby, if he makes transition, it's gonna be the 75 women, it's not gonna be the Cosby show, Fat Albert, Alvin Poussin, it's not gonna be all of the amazing things that he did in different communities to show up for folk. It's not gonna be any of that, it's gonna be the 75 women. Right. But you know, had he passed 20 years prior. You know, it would have been a hero's, you know, it's it's interesting. The queen, the queen of England, had she passed 20 years ago, it would have been like, you know, in the coronation and all of that, the people now are like, this is some bull crap. You know, it's, it's interesting how timing is also, the period of time that we're in is also uh, very relevant to how we view people. That's right. Well, a book that has... Uh captured your attention and and through you amplifying for folks to think about still on the focus we don't pay attention we don't pay attention and that was before the devices overtook us you know how um at what age would george washington have had to die <laughs> before we um wouldn't remember him as the father of our country i'm saying that tongue completely stitched to my cheek and um instead of uh, a slave owning criminal at no age. In other words, you know, uh, certainly Bill Cosby shouldn't have put his hand on any human being. And Hugh Hefner should never have uh, had a place where anybody could put their hand on any human being. But as he lays rotting in the ground, his body anyway, and his spirit is whatever it is, how is he remembered? Uh, as the original Jeffrey Epstein, apparently. Well, by those of us who were actually thinking as human beings, but he is um he is celebrated. You know, it's interesting. I was thinking about um because I had something completely different in my mind. Of course, Jim Brown made transition and nothing really changed except we have another point of entry, which is beautiful. Uh, I was thinking about um Nelson Mandela a lot. I told you I'm reading this new book. Johnny Steinberg wrote Winnie and Nelson on their marriage. 
and talking about how continental Africans, South Africans, uh, Kosa in particular, both in Nelson's family, Madiba's family, and Winnie's family, the Matazakelis, looked at marriage, looked at interrelations. You see multiple wives and children. And so there's that strain. Southern Africa, two particular cultures. Then you come back over here to where we were taken and you have the children of enslaved Africans. Uh, Jonathan Igg's book on King came out. I'm reading them both together. As like I said, since we talked uh, on Monday in the office, that was since we talked Saturday, I was at the Malcolm X Symposium in Philly, as we know. And I got a chance to, to talk with Herb Boyd for a few minutes and, Herb, and Baba Herb brought this up in his remarks that he was looking at Jonathan Igg's work too. And Igg, interestingly enough, enters King's life in the opening chapters through his father's bloodline, not his mother's. When Martin King Ted says, I'm the son of a minister and preacher, I'm the grandson, I'm the great, all the ministers in his line except his father came through his mother's line. So I'm interested in how this white man comes in through maleness because he has to do that as a white man. But at any rate, I'm, I haven't left Jim Brown and this question of women. In the early chapters in King, I narrates how Martin Luther King Sr., Daddy King's father, was an alcoholic brute. And how in that bloodline, you go back into enslavement and one of the ancestors was basically used as a breeder by the enslavers. So he got all these women pregnant and all these And I'm looking at how this white man narrates this. And I'm thinking about how Western culture looks at masculinity. Oh. And so when you look at a Jim Brown, when you look at a Bill Cosby, this isn't to excuse any of that behavior. But if we're going to have an honest and intelligent conversation, not a social media driven, pop culture driven, stolen focus driven babble fest, we would have to think very seriously, where did these traits and behaviors come up? Where did they enter? They did not enter on the other side of the Atlantic. We didn't pick up some badass habits from these white people who continue to reinforce this idea of masculinity in a way that they can crucify all of us and we should crucify ourselves for certain things and still celebrate this foolishness. Can yeah. I? Can you know, go ahead, please. <laughs> as, as you're talking, I'm also thinking about the hypocrisy. No of, question. Of this, you know, fame morality, pearls clutched. Uh, monogamy and Jesus and all of that, while you literally own 300 people and uh, Thomas Jefferson raped children and yeah, had you, talk about like, who literally wore a, a pedophile rapist. And then you have this, you know, we all, and you guys are savages. You know, we, we had to rescue you from the dark continent because you were brutes and savages, right? But that's savage, and it's savage to, to then gaslight the world forever for centuries. The whole world <laughs> for centuries around. I mean, you know, when they came to got us, when they came and got us, we had all these strip clubs and pornography. So we just yeah. what we was doing in Africa. Whoa, wait, 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 wait. No, Screwing no, no. sheep and getting passing around gonorrhea and no, nope, yeah. that was happening. Yeah. yeah, fascinated with the woman's booty. There's a brand new book out. This white woman has written called Butts, literally Butts. The history of Western obsession with behinds, and there's a whole middle section on Sardi Bartman, the one they call Sardi Bartman. We do not know her cause of name, but they paraded her through Europe, rape, 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 rape. The child died of syphilis before she was 30 years old, and it took the South Africans until damn near yesterday, a few years ago, to get her body back after they had disassembled her and put her on display. So, so if we're gonna talk, let's talk, but stop playing with us. And if we're gonna heal ourselves, we cannot look to Europe to the pathological, hypocritical, deeply, hmm, Come on. dare I say perverted? Yes. History of Europe, pornographia, pornography, the writing of harlots. You have literally, mm, mm. so. Yeah. Wait, 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 Dr. Carr, because I, I feel like uh, we none of this, we, we don't plan this. We get up and, no, and no. I hit, Jim I hit, Brown playing this though. Jim Brown. I, hit live I, hit. And I feel like I'm going to play this little video. <laughs> Listen, you know. Um, and what we not going to do. See, I want my look. This you is the perfect sweatshirt for Jim Brown. <laughs> what we not going to do is I need come to back to play football. Play football. No, yeah. the time. Come on, come yeah. on, bro. Come on. Um, mm. Can we also stop defending behavior that we know, like, because I feel like we all know, we know somewhere deep in our recesses of spiritual being, 
what what is community, what is helpful, what is not, you know, even around the discussion of John Morant. And it's not through the lens, and I need people to understand this. The conversations that I'm having on, on Sirius XM, the conversations that you and I are having, it's not through any white people's lens. It's through us remembering who were we before we got here? Who were we, the, as you say, the grandparents of society? What were the, the mores and the, and the rituals and the things that we did to foment community, to foster community, to raise healthy beings? What did we do then? And I feel like there's a lot of excuse making because some of us are walking around with the demented uh, psychosis that has been implanted in us for centuries. And it's hard to extricate. But we, the first step to uh, healing I hear somewhere is to admit that you have a problem. We all are sick. We all need healing. We all need help. We need to start there. That's right. And then start looking around at our family. Start there and, and see where the hypocrisies lie around the, the, the as we go into uh, family reunion season. You know, around letting the the, the uh, you know the oppressive uh, pedophiles at the you know at the space table, and nobody says anything. While little, I'm reading Stolen Focus. I'm at the chapter, Doctor Carr, where they talk about giving Ritalin to children because they can't pay attention. But when the real problem is the trauma that they're experiencing in their home, but they medicate them and they never talk to these kids. And one kid got their their head bashed in by their dad because, you know, it was abuse going on, which is why they couldn't focus coming to school every day, being abused at night, not being able to get a good night's sleep. But they medicated our uh, these children and they didn't talk about the abuse. One mother came in, watched, saw her husband abusing her son in the shower. Right. So she sends him off to his daddy to live, his, his birth daddy. And then they medicate him in school because he's still dealing with the trauma. But we don't fix that. We, we didn't we ask him. He that. didn't fix so. it right. And apologies years later, sure. But you didn't fix it. I mean, in big and small. And, and, and of course, we'll talk about this brother in a minute whose book, uh, Memoir, just came out in the blink of an eye. Uh, Mahmoud Abdul Rauf. He writes in here about how, of course, the brother we know, we'll talk about, you know, obviously point of entry. Well, but come on back, Prof, because I'm just mentioning it by way of the things we don't ask. Man says, I had Tourette's. I'm literally on the court with the Nuggets. And the lead calls and says, I got to be fined because I don't have my socks rolled up all the way because it's covering up the logo. What I'm trying to explain to them is I have Tourette's. I have a certain way I have to move through the world. My socks are down by my ankles, but I can't explain to you. I just know that if they're not down there, I'm obsessing about that. That's going to affect my game. So what does he do? He says, I rolled my socks up. And still serve John Stockton with 51. I'm saying, but but I'm saying, how what he could have y'all didn't listen to him. I don't have these socks down trying to defy you. I got these socks down because if I don't, if I pull them up, I'm gonna be thinking about these socks the whole game. So the point you're raising, we don't treat people like human beings in this culture. <laughs> so anyway, I just man, whoo, it's just hmm. So what do we how do we address that? How do we do because oh so I, I yeah. thank you. Um, I feel like Every day I get to be in community with you, every day that I get to be on these airwaves, and it's a, it's a privilege. It's not a right. It's a privilege for both of us, for all of us, yes. Every day there's somebody out there listening uh, that I feel like is going to get the help. I'm, I'm talking to more and more people, more and more celebrities who are in counseling, who have therapists, and, it, and, and are willing to talk about it, which is something that didn't happen 20 years ago. It is something, talking with Mahmoud Abdul Rauf. And then imagining not just the excoriation and the demonization and all of them. Good speech, Dr. Carl. Oh, that's, you, that's Jay Carell oh, telling you. Yeah, all, you know. <laughs> all those melanemic people who loved them when, when their team was winning, because we're mm. in that season now. You love the jersey, but then, oh, the flag. He's not standing for the flag. Like your patriotism is also a demented situation because it's. It's not rooted in anything right or righteous, right? So it, it's it's still rooted in this white whiteness, right? So I think about this man and what he could like to your point, what he could have been raised in terror, right? He didn't have a good, no. you know, to even be no, and to find solace in Allah, you know, like and then to be judged harshly and then lose your career, lose everything, have your home burned down, and still is a pleasant human being to be around, just a sweetheart. I think about the Central Park Five now, an exonerated five, and I think about Carrie Wise, um, who's still yeah. not. I mean, just talking with, I'm just like, oh, it makes me shake. Like, what could this brother have been? 
Yeah, that's true. That's so true. When you see him, he came to, to, to the law school at Howard a few years ago, and it's just immediately apparent. Your heart moves for anyone who has clearly been under perpetual assault, and then they've gone through that. And then you ask yourself, what can we do? Because, I mean, do we have we have an obligation to people, we do. don't we? So th- I feel like this is we, we first talk about it, make it make it normal. Oh, Question right. And challenge, right. So like, I don't know, every, everyone, there's a lot of, you know, we're in a culture where people are, you know, presented content for for clicks and likes. Um, you come in these YouTube comments, you're going to get gathered up by me and blocked because this you don't have a right to just talk out of your dingleberries about mm. you know, if you haven't read a book or sat in community with us, you're just not going to be spouting off. I'm just letting you know right now. I will gather you up. I spend a good deal of time doing that. In a chat gathering. I know. Yeah. I know. you. I mean, that's... Well, because because I want to live in a world where, where there's sensible people who want to actually you know, work towards something, not just have an opinion. We are stolen focus. will tell you, we are conditioned to have an opinion with no knowledge. We're conditioned because the opinions, the likes and the opinions and the engagement means money for these social media platforms, right? So the more you're on there spouting off stuff, you know, the more money they make. Facebook makes its money because you're on there. Twitter makes its money because you're on there. Instagram, TikTok makes its money because you spend an inordinate amount of time engaging with people, having an opinion about things you know nothing about. Right. That's that's the, that's the business model. That's right. And they can change that, but they if they change it, they make less money. They need you to be on there, right? They need so to be on there. What it has done is created a society where everyone has an opinion with no knowledge. So now we're here talking to at each other because I got an opinion. You ain't sat on a name brand, no footnotes. Oh, I went on YouTube. Well, YouTube's designed for you to go down a rabbit hole to end up with, you know, That's the right. documents and the freaking Illuminati. That's where it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's where the devil. You're, you're conditioned to be radicalized on YouTube because that's how the algorithm works. It's going to drag you deeper down a rabbit hole where you're going to get content that feeds your itchy little ears. That's right. And what is it, uh, chapter four in there on the loss of the inability to engage in sustained reading? Hmm. And, and, and like you said, it, even soundbite reading is difficult. I mean, when you ask who is Jim Brown to us, and I, and I, I, I didn't pull it. I keep this picture over there on, on the wall. Of course, these are the brothers at the so-called Ali Summit. Bill Russell, who became an ancestor recently, and Muhammad Ali, who was an ancestor. Now Jim Brown has joined them as an ancestor, leaving the only person who walks on top of the earth now, Lou Alcindor at the time, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Now, of course, we know this picture, which was taken in Cleveland as Ali refused to um, submit to going to Vietnam, to be drafted to going to Vietnam. What we not going to do is go halfway across the world and fight somebody who's not white on behalf of you when I see you every day. You my poser, as uh, Muhammad Ali would say. And so they call a meeting. That's who this picture represents to the social structure. This is a moment in the life of Jim Brown taking leadership, saying, I'm going to bring these faces together, these people who you only know because we are employees for your entertainment bread and circuses um rome but because you know us and because you know this brother and because you hate this brother we're going to put our arms around this brother listen to him then we'll have a press conference and say we stand with him but who are these brothers to us the back row tells a lot more about that in some ways than the front row we see the mayor of cleveland that of course uh carl stokes we see walter beach Walter Beach uh, wanted to, uh, at one point in his early professional career, he said, "There's, a, I think it was the Patriots, they were playing in Texas, the team he was playing for, he says, you know, they're segregated down there, they have these rules in place, it's not that we don't want to go, we will go, but could you, talk to the team, could you create a space where we could fly down maybe and not have to endure this segregation we can make some arrangements the team was like hmm how about this you're cut anyway Mm. (laughs) here we see bobby mitchell who's well known to fans of the washington commanders um here we have sid williams 
And then uh, there's, of course, the great Green Bay Packer, Willie Davis, Jim Shorter and John Wooten. But I skipped over this brother because this is the brother who probably symbolizes as much as anybody else in this picture, the governance formation. Who are we to each other? This is Curtis McClinton. Curtis McClinton in 1968 would co-found, along with Jim Brown, an organization known as the Negro Economic, uh, Negro, uh, well, the Black Economic Forum or the Black Economic, uh, oh my God, it's, 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 it's uh, I'm, I'm forgetting the name of it now, the Black Economic Forum or the Black Economic, put it this way, the Black Economic Forum, the Black Economic uh, Organization, it's the Negro Business and something or other. There's a book, there's a whole book about it and Jim Brown made transition so late in the evening or at least news of it came, apparently he made transition uh, the day before. But I'm looking around here. I couldn't find my Jim Brown stuff. A lot of it's in storage. But Dave Zirin's book is excellent on this and some other things. But um, oh, I wish I could think of the name of the thing. Uh, see, it's had to be quiet. The Black Economic Union. The Black Economic Union. It's called the Negro Business and something or other. But it's called the Black Economic Union. You know why the Black Economic Union pops in my head? Is because the Black Economic Union of Kansas City still exists. Look it up. Hmm. They have offices at 18th and Vine. That's where the Negro League Museum is and the Jazz Museum. Who are we to each other? Jim Brown, one of my favorite Jim Brown quotes. <laughs> and again, all my Jim Brown books, I couldn't find them. But I mean, you know, that's all right. One thing about reading, if you read enough and if you're quiet enough and read, you can pull a lot of the stuff up. I would like to go in greater detail, but this one always sticks in my mind. Jim Brown. And Prof, you may remember this. You may even remember because remember Spike Lee did that documentary and Jim Brown wrote his own memoir, Jim Brown Out of Bounds. And then Spike Lee did one for a home box office called Jim Brown All-American. It might even be a clip in there. Jim Brown was going, going, went to the locker room to, you know, showed up to play for the Browns one of his seasons. I guess what he played, 57 to 65, or I guess. And Brown is in the locker room. He comes in with a suit and a briefcase. And one of the white reporters asks him, I love these white reporters, these scribes. They ask him, why do you have on a suit? Why you got a briefcase? Now, mind you, Brown is planning what becomes the Black Economic Union. Because if we're going to be athletes, if we're going to make this money, if we're going to have this celebrity, if we're going to get these advertising dollars or whatever else, and this is when they're making a fraction of what they make today, we're going to pour that into our community. And of course, we would, as we would have expected, we saw LeBron James among everybody else shouting out one of his heroes, LeBron James, the son of an African son of Ohio, as you know, Jim Brown, of course, played for the Browns. Jim Brown looks at this white man and says, I got on a suit for the same reason you got on a suit. This is my job. Like, this is your job. I'm coming to work. I don't run out on the field in this suit. <laughs> I come in, change my suit, the work clothes, work, come back, put my suit on, and leave. The white man, of course, doesn't know what to say. Why? Because you're not talking to a slave. See, what we're not going to do hmm. is let you talk to me like the only time I emerge in your consciousness was I'm running a damn ball, a ball player. Much later, Jim Brown. No, I'm sorry. Fred Williamson, the hammer. Another athlete, Bernie Casey. Why do we know these names? We don't know these names for their prowess on the football field. We know them because they movie people. They was in the movies. And when Fred Williamson, who went on to have a vision of and implement in many ways, this vision of black on black control filmmaking to the degree that he could in the piece. And by the way, of course, the famous movie, I think, well, did Williamson produce uh, Boss N-Word? They call it Boss Negro now for the home releases. Uh, anyway, was that Jim Brown? Anyway, the point is this. Yes, Boston were 1975. Okay, was that Williamson? Yes, I, it was. Mm, that was the black. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I tell you what. No, I, I'm straight, Dr. Carr. I'm scrolling his filmography. Oh, you talking about the hammer? You talking about Williamson? Sickening. Oh, is, no question. No question. No, this is the point, right? Who are we to each other? But you know what Fred Williamson said? Fred Williamson said it was Jim Brown who showed us the way of going from running on the field to being in the movies. And when we yank on Fred Williamson, Jim Brown falls out. Who are we to each other? Fred Williamson said, I can make movies, not just act in the movies, 
I can make the movies. I can produce the movies. I can get the script. If Fred Williamson, going back a generation before Fred Williamson to Jim Brown's friend, Sam Cooke, had been able to create that space, but who was against him? The whole damn social structure. No, N-word, your job is to run. And if you're in a movie, it's because we put you in a movie. Jim Brown had so much damn charisma when he made that first Western, was it Rio Lobo or whatever it was. They was like, he said, I never acted. But then after they saw me on the screen, they started making roles for me. Ice Station Zebra. He said, it wasn't for a white man in the better, the Dirty Dozen. You know what I'm saying? You know, and then Jim Brown is like, okay, this is cool. You know, and then, you know, <laughs> all right. Schnell was like, hey, you need to come back to Cleveland to run. He said, well, you know, give me a little flexibility. He said, no, if you don't come back, you're going to be fine. Jim Brown's like, bet, called a press conference. What we're not going to do, <laughs> what we're not going to do is be talked to like we're not human beings. That's my job. And guess what? Nine years in the league, I'm the greatest football player that ever lived. I didn't broke all the damn records. And guess what? As he went on to tell subsequent generations of football players, do not kill yourself to get them last two inches. <laughs> he said, what I'm not going to do is, what we're not going to do is break my body another season for the Cleveland Browns or for anybody else. Here you go, brother. I quit. Hmm. Art Snell, uh, Art Snell, that's the coach, football player. Uh, Art, uh, what's his name? Art Modell. Modell. Thank you. I call him Art Snell. Thank you, bro. Thank you, bro. Art Modell lived long enough to say I made a mistake. Yeah, I think what we're not going to do is wait on you to apologize after I'm an old man and then broke my body and played another five or six seasons. And Jim Brown never missed the game. So, I'm saying all that to say that Fred Williamson said Jim Brown showed us that we could be in the movies and transition. And then I took it from there and said, I could produce the movies. I can make the movies. I could. And, 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 and people call that black. I'm sorry. Social structure calls that black exploitation. And then too many of us picking up on that foolishness call it black exploitation. Is it not sure? Do you want to come up with another title for a movie? Then boss N word. And any y'all, I'm looking in the chat. Any y'all seen boss N word? They call it boss Negro now or Bl boss Black. That's a movie. Um, that's the movie where the lead character comes out of slavery. A lot of these black exploitation movies start in slavery. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You're looking at Buck and the Preacher, which is indigenous people, African people, Reconstruction period, come, going out west. So the westerns, a lot of those westerns are really about coming out of enslavement and then self-determination. In fact, I just saw a trailer for a movie coming out soon with Letitia Wright playing a formerly enslaved person and she's in the covered wagon going west and they got they chasing some white criminal. Anyway, this whole thing, hard they come, I mean, all these movies. But in this, in this particular movie, the character becomes the sheriff of the town. The, the formerly enslaved person. And I remember at one scene, he's sitting there with his deputy who is this kind of blackface not minstrel, but like a black version of these white sidekick, like a Festus, those of you old enough remember Gunsmoke, or Barney Fife, those of you remember that Andy Griffin show, or a Kevin Hart in uh, just about everything. But the point is that this sidekick, the comic relief sidekick kind of thing. And so they're sitting at a table and the sheriff says something and the deputy says something. And then some white man comes to serve them tea or something, because this is the sheriff and the deputy. And the, the deputy drops something on the ground or something like that. And, 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 and the guy goes to pick it up and then he drops it again. And he tells him to go off and bring me something. And then after the white man leaves the table, the deputy says to the sheriff, sheriff said, well, you don't even like such and such. I mean, whatever he sent him to get. He said, no. But I've been waiting to do that ever since I was in slavery. And my master used to make me go get that. And then he started laughing. <laughs> Is that black exploitation? Come on, friends, because what we're not going to do is play the damn lackey all the time. If I'm Pam Greer, I'm going to come out my afro with a knife or a gun and blow your face off. Oh, my God, it's black exploitation. Really? Is it black exploitation? Why you put that label on that? For the cathartic relief it gives us. <laughs> you know what I'm anyway, go ahead. <laughs> my childhood was shaped by Jim Kelly. Come on now. By... um. Oh my God, Cleopatra Jones, Tamara Dobson. Tamara Dobson, no question. You know, like it it gave me power. I, I remember leaving the movie theater 
Get Christy Love. Get is, Christy Love. You know, I, I, as a young black girl, little girl, wanting to kick some booty because oh, yes, I know the, the brothers love Pam Greer, but Tamara Dobson and Bernie Casey? Come on. That, Come man. on. Somebody dropped in the chat the le the legend of N word Charlie all of Black Caesar look at them they putting it in it <laughs> but Jim Brown it's Jim Brown that kicks in the door I'm not sure they're gonna have some ham fisted rolls was it uh was it the Dirty Dozen where he's running and obviously fastening everybody on the set but <laughs> but then of course is it Rio Lobo what's the one where he was kissing on um Raquel Welch. Was that 100 rifles? Hold on. Aha! I think it was, bro. Oh, good. Very good. See, see, we talk about it. The part of the true that it was 100 rifles. Yeah, 100 rifles. See, this is what I love about it. See, this, and, and you know, this is one of the things I love about the space that we have on Saturdays, the space that we have in Nubia and narrative. When we convene, it allows us to turn down the noise on the distractions and turn up our memories so as people are convening around here to now this isn't to avoid any of the complicated stuff we're going to you know touch on a lot of that stuff today jim brown like all humans but jim brown more so than many is a is a difficult figure but one thing's for sure jim brown is not this guy in the obituaries that will be written. This will be mentioned, but it's not going to be led with this, including creating an, a, 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 an, a company, a nonprofit, a corporation, a union for Black self-determination. That's not what leads the obituaries. You're not going to go out and have a conversation with all of these brothers, the first Black mayor of a major American city, you say, well, are we talking about first Negroes? No, that ain't even the point. The point is, if you read uh, Nishani Frazier's book, Harambe City on CORE and Cleveland, there's more going on than just getting a black person in a seat. The Congressional Black Caucus just had a retreat uh, last week or this past week where they're talking about plans on how we need to move forward politically. And um, a good uh, brother from Nevada, Stephen Horsford, who's the chair of the CBC, was saying the other day, on Roland Martin's show on um, Thursday night when I was on, he he, he was saying, and I, and he was talking about what they were doing. And I asked him a question. I said, now y'all are going through the South. You're going to be talking to local leadership. You're going to be organizing with individuals. And I said, uh, uh, please make sure, if you can, that you tap into the unutilized, not underutilized, unutilized intellectual capital at historically black colleges. Because many of the places you're going behind the cotton curtain are anchored by these folk in the communities. And I saw at the retreat, you had Michael Eric Dyson, you had Kimberly Crenshaw, no shade to both of those fine, uh, well, talking about complicated lives, both of those fine scholars. But let's be clear, you don't have to have them or anybody else when you go into these communities because the thinking work, the organizing work is done by the people in the communities and if you want an academic, someone with licensure, then you don't need to go to Vanderbilt. You need to go to Tennessee State and Fisk. You don't need to go to Emory. And that's no shade to the black folk who work at Emory, but you need to go to the Atlanta University Center, sir. You don't need to go to Baylor. You don't need to go to Rice. You don't go, need to go to the University of Texas in Austin and find the folk there. You need to go to Texas Southern and Prairie View. You need to go to Bishop. You need to go to the HBCUs. His response, well, thank you. I'll take that critique. Now, it wasn't necessarily a critique. I was just making it, but I do see who you did have on this list. And I said, I didn't see any HBCU folk there. And then he said, yeah, you know, but you know, at the retreat, I must say that we had Kimberly Crenshaw and Michael Eric Dyson. Didn't I just, okay, the point is this. <laughs> who we are to other people, you keep bringing the same people because that's how you've been shaped by your master. Because your master has literally cultivated a template for how we should even think about our own liberation and then curated who we should be getting. Now we're going to pick the people you should be listening to. Now, 
once we see them, we might say, oh, good, come on in. Or you've come from us, let's have a conversation. But, but what we're not going to do is anchor who we listen to based on you. So these obituaries will mention this in passing, but they ain't going to talk about Curtis McClinton. They ain't going to talk about the black economic woman. They're going to they talk about Ali's stand and how they came to support him. But they ain't going to talk about what this birth in our governance formation. And when we're talking our African states framework about movement and memory, how did or do we remember these experiences? Too often, we only remember this for the very necessary support of our brother as he fought against that system. Doctor, now, do you know the person hidden behind? Uh, no, no, I don't. The guy behind, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. I don't know who I, that I wonder is. if he's hitting on purpose. I'm, I was there, but I ain't showing my face. Very good point, because this brother right here lost his job. Yeah, <laughs> simply because he didn't want to But make sure I'm standing behind this tall person. Happy. You know what? I love it. See, see, that's what cultural meaning making, right? That's exactly right. Now, this is the front page of today's New York Times. Above the fold, as they continue to, uh, this is, uh, and interesting enough, we should mention this, as Jakarta, the capital of Indonesia, sinks into the sea. The president has embarked on a mission to construct a new capital some 800 miles away on the island of Warneo. Global warming is real. Wait, wait, what? <laughs> The whole, t you know, uh, you, you, did you read the piece that New York City is sinking? Yes. As well, under yes. The, uh, one millimeter every single year, which doesn't seem like a lot, but then we don't know when the tipping point's going to happen. When it, right. just, right. Remember, was that, it was during COVID, right? Where they did the thing in the times where they had the interactive map and you could see how the water, <laughs> what they project. You're exactly right. It don't seem like nothing, but let's be very clear. This is now, Jakarta, Indonesia is, what is it, third, fourth most populous country in the world? Mm. How many people live in Jakarta? 30 million. So we over here, paper or plastic? Nah, not even. Going to plastic bags. We are here polluting the world and thinking we good. And of course, meanwhile, the people paying attention are doing things like buying up all the real estate in little Haiti in Miami, as we've talked about in office hours. And one time sis came in from Haiti and was talking about that. I mean, and here they got to move the whole capital, Jakarta. Why? Because it's going to be underwater soon. And New York City, it's coming. It's coming. So in the context of the, the, the transition of Jim Brown, the New York Times has his obituary on the front page a football great and a civil rights champion. Okay, that's incorrect. Football great for sure. Civil rights Jim Brown once said, <laughs> if I march, I'm be marching by myself. I'm not going out here in the streets to get beat up by, you know. But civil rights is what the social structure thinks. Jim Brown is about self-determination. Even when many of us might say, Jim, you did that's wrong. Yeah, but I'm wrong because what we're not going to do is just do something because everybody doing it. Jim Brown was sitting up with Donald Trump and Kanye West. Yes. Here's what the hell is wrong with Jim Brown? Who's this? Jim Brown. Oh, OK. Now, meanwhile, <laughs> meanwhile, he could be dead wrong. But here's the thing about Jim Brown. What do we know about Jim Brown with that with that with that red, black and green koofy low slung over his foot? <laughs> When, this is the point, one of the points Richard Pryor was making. You can say what you want to about Jim Brown, but in the presence of Jim Brown, it ain't but so much foolishness going to come out your mouth. And is Jim Brown going to let you pull him off of his square? The answer is no. I'm not going along to get along. The presence of Jim Brown signals the sense that this is an anchor, right or wrong. Look to what might be considered a toss, a toss off role in the films later in his life, something where he only has a couple of uh phrased lines. Any given Sunday, we continue to pray for James. Just the presence of Jim Brown in the room says, Okay, we're gonna watch him because what he say or doesn't say is gonna carry some weight. So, yeah, we don't want to see Jim Brown in the room with Donald Trump and Kanye West off his meds, losing his mind. But it's Jim Brown. So 
while we might not agree, we understand. Jim Brown, when he was eight years old, his mom moved them to New York. But for his entire life, which is why he was inducted back in the early aughts, maybe 2007 or 8, the Gullah Geechee Hall of Fame. Jim Brown's a Geechee. Jim Brown, when they were asking, where you from? St. Helena Island. Jim Brown is Gullah. Jim Brown comes out of that space of self-determination. So when you look at this obituary, which goes through what you would expect, and you see, let me see. Now, of course, uh, A20, page A20. On the front page, it's, you know, you know, prominently enough place. But then what do they do? Well, they give him the whole... <laughs> now, there's the famous picture, right? And here, of course, is the real thing. He's playing football. Here he is down here in the movies, right? This is from the Dirty Dozen, right? And so what does it say? It said, and here, here, of course, is the picture, the small picture with him in the suit, where it says, Brown in 2013, when Monahesset High School honored him, he struggled at times off the field, including accusations of violence against women. What is the uh, the the the, uh, the tag here? At left, Bill Russell, Muhammad Ali, Brown, and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, then known as Lou Alcindor, seated from left, met in 1967 to voice their support for Ali. Yeah, but the other part of self-determination ain't mentioned. And that's fine. That's fine. Uh, because we know that that's not what it's about. That's not what it's about. This isn't, a, in fact, let me see here. Uh, Jim Brown, the Cleveland Browns fullback. Now, he ain't played for the Cleveland Browns since 1965. But, of course, that's how the social structure knows him, and that's how we've been trained to know him. And that is, frankly, why we know him. Who was acclaimed as one of the greatest players in pro football history and who remained in the public eye as a Hollywood action hero and civil rights activist. See, the language fails, but I understand why they would say civil rights activist, because to the social structure, that's what anyone who stands for self-determination is about. They're trying to fight their way in. They're literally trying to... Um, become part of this criminal enterprise. They're trying to improve it. They're trying to save it. Again, one of the favorite, favorite quotes of the uh, current president of the United States is fighting for the soul of America. So I'm not fighting for the damn soul of America. We, we, we haven't left my mood, Abdul Rauf, by the way. I'm going to bring in Brittany Griner in a second as well. But whether it be Jonathan Igg's new book on King, A Life, which opens with the idea that somehow Martin Luther King is fighting for America. And I'll admit, I'm only about 100 pages in, so I'm going to see if it changes. But the prologue, don't even worry about my marginalia. I already started marking it up. Uh, Ig says, on December 5th, 1955, a young black man became one of America's founding fathers. He was 26 years. Okay. See, I'll be mad from the first line and some of this stuff. <laughs> Malefia Sante used to say, I can read the first five pages of a book and tell you what's going to go. And I know what he means because it isn't about what's, you know, there are new FBI files here. There are new interviews. Uh, Daddy King recorded a, 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 a notes for a memoir. Of course, he published the book Daddy King while he was alive, but I had access to this recorded memoir. Uh, interviewed a lot of the people, had access to files that weren't present. This is the first major biography of King in about 35 years. So I get why my friend Peniel Joseph would say, you know, uh, King is a major achievement. Blah. Blah. <laughs> Blah. Anyway, the prologue. <laughs> On December 5th, 1955, a young black man became one of America's founding fathers. Okay. At this point, the rest of the book is worthless. No, that's not true. At this point, I already know the framework is wrong. Because we read together. Remember everybody here in Nubia, on the Nubia side. We read Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community. So when you call somebody like Martin Luther King a patriot or a founding father, you say, well, well, damn. He was escaping religious persecution in England? No, you're talking about the people here 
who are trying to make a more perfect union. But by saying a more perfect union, what you are stipulating is that the thing that happened before that, although flawed, still has a sound structure. And so often what we see is that, when, as Mahmoud Abdul Rauf writes in the blink of an eye in his memoir, what he says is, when we do something, it's a character flaw. When we do something, it's an irreversible problem. We're a problem to be contained. When Amer and when other countries do something, America says we got to come in and, and, and do something about that because this democracy is at stake and y'all are brutal. He said, but when America does something, somehow, no matter how bad it was, it was always a mistake. This is why this boy got in trouble. <laughs> this man got in trouble. This man got in trouble because when they asked him, when the reporter came to the Nuggets and said, I, I noticed that uh, that uh, Chris Jackson, because a lot of times they wouldn't call him by his Muslim name, even though he changed after he came out of LSU, uh, noticed that Abdul Rauf isn't standing for the anthem. Uh, can we talk to him and ask why? So what does the do the Denver Nuggets staff do, including the head coach, a black man named Bernie Bickerstaff? They give them access. And what Brother Rauf, Abdul Rauf says is, I gave the interview. I said, well, I'm not standing because, you know, I'm a Muslim and part of my faith requires me to engage things as they are. And honestly, and quite frankly, you know, he gives his political statement. I'm not standing, you know, because, you know, some of the things that have happened in this country and the way this country has treated my people and I'm not in agreement with. And so it's just, you know, that's all. He said, I thought that was it. Here come Bickerstaff. Talking about, uh, we got a word from up high. You know, this is a problem. You either stand for the anthem or you don't play. So Brother Mahmoud says, well, you what? Okay, well, y'all do what you got to do. So he gets ready to leave, and he says, well, you're not playing tonight. He said, wait a minute, what? What do you mean I'm not playing tonight? He said, well, the, the suspension starts now. The suspension? So he sits the game out. They call Rod Thorne at the NBA office and say the, the union gets involved. What? Okay, we want to know, you know, he violated the rule, but is that a severe? Rod Thorne, you know what Thorne says, of course. You know, pro. You know, Thorne says, what rule? <laughs> they ain't got no rule the damn nuggets made it up and then a black man the head coach goes and delivers the news same black man who comes back a few weeks later after he says okay well i'll stand but i'll just pray because i'm standing but i'm praying for all the victims of hypocrisy i'm praying for all the people who suffer but i'm standing bigger staff is like why don't you take the rest of the year off then they trade him to the kings my point is this is Mahmoud Abdul Rauf a founding father? Is Colin Kaepernick, who never played another down, which is why I haven't watched a down of football and probably never will, professional football, did he play another down? This is, by the way, published by Kaepernick Books in the blink of an eye. Mahmoud Abdul Rauf's memoir. No. And then Mahmoud Abdul Rauf writes movie. He puts this in the first chapter, by the way, to get it out of the way. He spends almost all the rest of the book talking about his life, this young boy from Mississippi. As you say, Prof, and, it, 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 and when you were telling me about sitting with him and interviewing him and being so, you know, touched by his spirit, you know, it, it, it all lines up. I mean, this is an honest thing, y'all. In the blink of an eye, my goodness, I'm reading this like, wow, all his ins and outs with women, his family, when he went damn near broke, the people who stepped up and helped him, whether it be uh, Sharif Abdul Rahim, sent him some money, uh, uh, Hakeem Olajuwon, what do they have in common? They Muslims. Not that that's the only thing. They played in the league. They all know each other, this kind of thing. You know, just thinking because, you know, this man has his career show sh cut. He's trying to make it to his NBA pension. He draws it at 45, which means it's half of what he would have got at 55. He could have stayed out, but he's overseas trying to play to feed his family. Then the money is gone from the, his bank account because he had a joint bank account. His wife, he said, we broke. Now, what do you mean we broke? I just came back from overseas. Where's the money? I mean, all this, these ups and downs, but then he's thanking God the whole time for the strike. But did he get run out the league? Should he be in the Hall of Fame? A lot of people who are basketball fans 
the minute they mention Steph Curry, there's a handful of us, not even more than a handful, you, of course, who wrote about and followed this and who knew some of these guys, women and men, and a lot of us who watch spectators say, yeah, you know, no, no, no. Hey, look, Steph Curry is the absolute truth. Do you know Mahmoud abdul Rahul? And then look, press play on Chris Jackson in two years he was at LSU. Or ask Shaquille O'Neal who says he was the best player. Not me. Y'all looking at me, but this boy right here, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I'm saying all that to say that they, they threw him out. They put him in the exile, then they threw him out the league. You can't get back in. Did Craig Hodges shoot another three-pointer? Showing up, giving George Bush a letter, critiquing what the U.S. foreign policy in his African clothes. Did he play again? Nah. And then Michael Jeffrey Jordan, who has been such a smashing success as the ancestors say, Carolina, you're not getting the first pick. Anyway, <laughs> did he step up for his friend who helped him win championship? No. Why? Because you got to dance, buddy. But what we're not going to do, some of us, is trade our humanity. And, of course, life is long for a lot of people. And, the, and Jordan has stepped up in some ways politically that he didn't before. But sometimes it's a question of timing. Jim Brown was the best football player by far in the National Football League, 30 years old at the height of his career. And when that white man said, nigga, get back on this field, he would say, bye, I'm going to call a press. I'm not even calling you back. Next time you hear my voice, it's going to be a press conference. I quit. The hell do you think I am? I'm Gullah Geechee from South Carolina. I don't play. Bruh. The same way I run over them boys on the field, I'm running over you because I'm running through you. I have an agenda. And so movement and memory in our African states framework, we're obligated to use this moment as a point of entry. Why? Because the social structure has movement and memory. Again, I'll just mention this quite quickly in 30 seconds. When we created that African states framework, it was, as we, as we know, it was a part of creating this framework for this mandatory high school African-American history course at the School of Philadelphia. African-American history is not Africana studies. Most of what passes for Africana studies now is not Africana studies. Africana studies, as we've said over and over again, I'm just reinforcing it here to make this point I'm gonna make after this is about asking the right questions. It's the how we study Africana, not the subject, not what we're studying. Interesting black stuff. Oh, I'm in black studies. Why? Because I'm studying black people. That don't make you in black studies. That just make you studying black people. What are the tools you're using? What are the questions you're asking? What are the frameworks you're creating? So in our African states framework, we knew that the best way for we to have this for us to have this resonate was to make sure that we created conceptual categories that allow you to ask questions, the answers to which will have us engage in seeing each other and interacting with each other as human beings. So all of the conceptual categories apply to any group of human beings, to any individual human beings. So a social structure that is anti-Black, like the one we live in, globally, and its local manifestations, the system we live in has its own movement and memory, particular to its place and wherever it is in the world, whatever the circumstances are. So as Jim Brown makes transition, the U.S. social structure is going to narrate him as a ball player who was in the movies, who did a few civil rights things, who also was uh, allegedly beaten up on women and was controversial. OK, absolutely. All true. But that's who he is to you. Who is he to us? Well, before we go back to that, let's ask even here's Martin Luther King. Who is Martin Luther King to the social structure? Well, David Icke says he's a damn founding father. He says on December 9th, 1955, a young black man became one of America's founding fathers. He was 26 years old and knew the role he was taking carried a potential death penalty. The place was Montgomery, Alabama, formal capital of Alabama's slave trade. Boy, you couldn't even wait. Now, this book is, si <laughs> I started to say 666 pages, but it's not. Because that's the page I flipped to in the index. Including the index, it is 669 pages. And on the prologue, which is page three, the first paragraph, you got slave in. See where this is going. And that's okay. When I read that, I'm like, no, of course I'm going to keep reading. Because look, here's the thing. I don't read books expecting that I'm going to agree with the people. I'm reading books for information. And books like this, I'm not even reading for perspective except to see what the perspective is so that when it comes up again, we can gently, if it's talking about African people, bring it to an Africana framework. So I'm not reading Ike's book for, uh, please, I already knew what this was going to be, or at least I suspected it. The other thing about it is 
even though you may suspect something, don't just use that. And you got to still engage it, which is the point you were raising earlier when it comes to this question of just saying whatever. No, 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 no. As Dr. O'Many used to say, it's knowledge by fact or reason, knowledge by opinion, knowledge by faith. Try to incorporate all of them, but don't leave knowledge by reason and fact and, and research. Oh, uh, don't leave that off. So I had assumptions about this text. But I need to read the text. So I'm like, hmm. So I'm keeping, I'm, I'm looking for it. I'm looking for it. I don't expect Africa in here. And I ain't found it. Because he then goes into the whole thing. You know, I mean, just look at the first uh, the first uh, part. It's in three parts. So the first part of the book, the Kings of Stockbridge, chapter one, after the preface. That's when he gets into this whole father's line and, you know, the drunks and, you know, the, and the women, you know, and fighting back, this kind of thing. Uh, chapter two, Martin Luther, chapter three, Sweet Auburn. Now he's in Atlanta, of course. Uh, chapter four, Black America still wears chains. Okay, this chain metaphor gonna carry us. Why? Because you start our history with slavery. And as John Clark said, if you start your history with slavery, everything since then looks like progress. Who are we to other people? To the social structure, Jim Brown's a ball player. Yeah, he was born somewhere and yeah, he came up somewhere and yeah, his daddy wasn't a brown of it. But to Jim Brown, who is he to us? And who is he? Who are we to him? He's not from St. Helena, man. Gullagichi. Okay, see, that don't mean nothing to the social structure. It just becomes interesting. Now, we saw, what's the brother, uh, Prof, um, One Night in Miami? Is Aldous Hodge? Is that his name? Aldous Hodge. Yep, Aldous Hodge. Wonderful actor. Played the hell out of that role. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. And remember, as he comes into the white man's house early on, you get a glimpse of that Gullah Geechee spirit. So the more we know, the more we can even reframe things that are offered, regardless of who they've off or they're offered from. And so here we are a day past Malcolm X's birthday, 19th of May. Of course, he knew Malcolm, Jim Brown, Jim Brown, Malcolm knew him. You know, this isn't fiction, them interacting with each other. That self-determination by 1965, February 1965, Malcolm X is dead. Two years later, you see these brothers meeting with Muhammad Ali, who has changed his name from Cassius Clay because he was in the nation of Islam. Last Saturday, when I was in Philadelphia, you know, there with, with Brother Mark, uh, Mark Lamont Hill at the sixth uh, annual Malcolm X Symposium, I'm going up the steps into the church where it's being held down the street from Uncle Bobby's, his bookstore and cafe there in the Germantown section of Philly. And I see all these brothers from the nation. Why? Because Wesley Muhammad, uh, Dr. Muhammad is one of the people who's on one of the panels. So, of course, the nation is there in full force. And, of course, I can't get up the steps because <laughs> the brothers is like, Dr. Cars, ah, salam alaikum, alaikum salam. Yeah, y'all doing, beloved, fine. How you doing, buddy? Hey, man, we love y'all. Talking about you, Professor Hunter, talking about me, talking about all of us who are trying to do this important work of being in conversation with each other and add to it our memory, regaining our momentum of memory. Now, there are people who would say who have a litmus test for a lot of Negroes who, uh, like this brother, perhaps in this in this picture, try to evade the, the question. Do you support Louis Farrakhan? Mm. Well. Do you support the United States of America? <laughs> you know, do you wrap yourself in the flag? Why are you asking me? First of all, I'll be a fool to even think about answering a question like that. Who are you to me? Who are you to me? But I tell you what, I tell you who I trust more than you, because I don't know you, but I know plenty of people in the nation of Islam, some of the finest people I know on the planet, and not fine on both sides. Like, I don't know anybody in the nation of Islam who drove their car into a crowd and killed somebody even who looked like them. Like in Charlottesville, Virginia. I'm saying all that to say this. Jim Brown, when Jim Brown was squashing the beef between Crips and Bloods, and you didn't see it covered in the New York Times. You didn't see it covered in the Washington Post. You didn't see it on CNN, but I tell you where you read the blow for blow. Every time they had a meeting, all over the pages of the final call, who are we to each other? And if I wanted to read, I'm going to read the Post, I'm going to read the Financial Times of London, I'm going to read the New York Times, I'm going to read the Webs, I'm going to read China Today. By the way, they had a huge, they're having a huge summit. This is actually China Daily. Uh, the Sino-Kazakh, uh, they're having a whole summit over there right now with the countries uh, in that region. Central Asia, it's called the China Central Asia Summit, two-day summit, which opened on Thursday. 
And then Friday they had it. Today, of course, the G the G seven is meeting in Hiroshima. Hmm. Do you support the nation of Islam? Well, do you support dropping two bombs on Japan, atomic bombs? Because last I checked, ain't no African country in the nation of Islam. Damn sure ain't dropped no bomb. They ain't got a bomb to drop. Your ass dropped two. And then, how did or do we remember this experience in in this social structures movement? And remember, you go back to the scene of the crime to act like you've made progress. And what do we do? It's now a place of peace. The Chinese is like, we'll be there, but we got to do something first. What? Well, we're gonna have this Central Asia uh, summit for two days, then we coming. And guess who got to cut his trip short to the G7 to get back to this criminal enterprise because the hillbilly horde is threatening to bankrupt y'all asses. Do you support the nation of Islam? Do you support Kevin McCarthy? Because in a minute, your dollar ain't going to be worth nothing. Why? Because in August, they all meeting again. This is Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, the so-called BRICS. And about a dozen nations have said they want to join the BRICS, including Nigeria and Mexico. And they are one of the things they're discussing is how do we move the world currency from the dollar? Meanwhile, Marjorie Taylor Greene, who shows up at State of the Union uh, 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 speeches dressed like Ric Flair, whoa, <laughs> and uh, Kevin McCarthy, you know, all them talking about we'll bankrupt the country. Fool, see that knife? Here's the problem we have. I don't give a damn. You cut your whole head off, but the problem is my head next to your head. Who are we? See, what we're not going to do is pretend like there's a we. Yeah. And they, ain't a, they can't Gaddafi everybody. They can't. Professor Ooh. Karen Hunter, please help us. Uh, you can't Gaddafi everybody. He can't. And if you right now look at Libya, ungovernable Libya. Yes, I'm talking to you, Hillary Rodham Clinton. And yes, Barack Obama in your pajamas, drinking your tea and trying to figure out how you can roll another uh, quasi-factual Netflix documentary off your assembly line. We haven't forgotten that the destabilization of Libya escalated with you. This is not caping for Muammar Gaddafi. This is understanding that when you start touching one thing, you touch a lot of other things. In fact, the uh, foreign, anytime you see foreign affairs start talking about stuff, see Gaddafi, and a lot of these countries is like, we're not going with the United States and the European Union, but we're not going with the Russians either. They started this after World War II. They escalated it 10 years after the end of World War II with the Bandung Conference. We talked about that a little bit when we talked about Adam Clayton Powell. And, of course, talking about Malcolm X. And anytime you see the social structure begin to put on the front page of their signature platforms, the fact that we got to pay attention to this and do something about it, like the May-June 23 <coughs> issue of Foreign Affairs, the non-aligned world, the West, the rest, and the new global disorder. You know what they're saying? You can't Gaddafi everybody. We got to get a handle on this. Guess what? That ship done sailed, sir. You're done. The only question is, are we going to stand by and let you blow up the world? Because y'all got real problems and you got nuclear weapons. Do you support the nation of Islam? Do you support the United States of America that bombed Japan twice? And now, oh, it's all over. You come back. Now you have the G7 summit. But China already had a summit the day before you came to the G7. And uh, and Joe Biden got to cut his trip short. Last Saturday, he was talking to uh, the Howard students. And it's wonderful. And this uh, Sunday, he'll be flying his behind back because the hillbilly horde, his hillbilly flank, which he, by the way, was only too happy to appease when he put Clarence Thomas on the Supreme Court as the chair of the Judiciary Committee, is now growing completely out of control. But if you know the history of the United States, you understand that this is a rerun. Or as KRS One might have said, instead he be serious. This is a remix. <laughs> In other words, the 1850s should give you clues about what's about to happen next. When it breaks this time, we're not gonna put it back together. So, when we think about then what we do, this in this Africana Studies framework, how did or do we remember these experiences? When someone like Jim Brown makes transition, I'm sorry. When in, whenever anyone, let me let me reset that for a minute. Whenever anyone makes transition, it's a moment for us to reflect, not only on their lives, but there's a reason why we use the phrase life and times. <laughs> and a few minutes ago, we had a moment, a collective moment. Let me glance down at the app again, because I've got the Nubia app on. Those of you on YouTube haven't. Yeah, I am. I'm going to keep drinking it. You know, I got to have that water. Do more, more, more water. He was incredibly stubborn. 
Jim Brown was incredibly stubborn, legendary Hall of Fame stubbornness, no question. As we reflect on life and times, it gives us a chance to think about ourselves as a community. And as I said, I had other plans today, but I think they're weaving them in because I was thinking about these two books I'm reading now. And as we spend time on Monday nights, everyone in Nubia and office hours, fleshing out, I hope we'll bring some of these conversations this morning into that evening space for those couple of hours because I want to continue this conversation. You think about the fact that the thing I wanted to raise and the thing I am raising, but I'm going to be very explicit about it now. Maybe we'll return to it next week after I finish these two books. You know, the question is, when we talk about having a nation within a nation, we talk about black folk as a we anywhere in the world. First of all, is it possible? Is it possible? And if it is possible, is it necessary? And if it is necessary, how do we do it? What do I mean by that? Is it possible? Howard French, um, our good brother and friend, just published a piece in this week's New York Review of Books. It's the New York Review of Books. He's got a piece in here where he's reviewing two books that we talked about a few months ago. Baba Oz brought them up because it came out in the UK first. At least one of them did. What Britain did to Nigeria. I remember we were talking about that. And then I picked up a copy and read it. What Britain did to Nigeria, a short history of conquest and rule. And the other book, that's by uh, Max Siolum, Siolum. And then the other one is Formation, the making of Nigeria from jihad to amalgamation by Fola uh, Fagbule and Fei uh, Fawahini. And what Howard French does, what B Brother Howard, uh, Howard does, is talk about Nigeria as we know it is. Here's the article, The Creation of Nigeria. He talks about it as the creation of the English. Now, if you think of Nigeria, I'm just doing this like this is Nigeria. You have a North and a South. That's the split. North, largely Muslim. South, uh, they say Christian and animist, whatever the hell that is. Indigenous people got faith traditions and all throughout this, but mostly they say Muslim, Christian. And in the South, you got a split, right? East-West split, so to speak. It's cobbled together hundreds of different languages, thousands of different indigenous groups that were never in these lines. And what French does in his review is talk about the fact that all of these, this, this configuration called Nigeria, this place that might have as many as 400 million people 30, uh, 30 years from now, as Nigeria goes, Africa goes, and increasingly the world. One of every six Africans on the continent is, in, is from Nigeria. And let me just read you, not, not, not go through the history of this. I'm going to go to the last paragraph because I'll tie this to where we're talking now. Because again, the thing that's been animating my mind ever since I started uh, the Nelson and Winnie book and then uh, was re and reading the I book against it is how do we think of ourselves in a governance, in governance, in not a governance, form, in governance formations? How do we think of ourselves in governance formations? while existing in these social structures, which were set up as exploitative, which literally created the we, that we are now having to fight our ways out of. So when we talk about remembering, in some ways we are membering. So remembering presumes a state that pre-existed and we never existed as a global people. Not in the way China does. Remember Monday night, we talked about those graphic uh, novels uh, that. Jing Liu did the five volumes uh, on the history of China. If those of you not in Nubia, you had to come over to Nubia. We talk more about that. But here's what Howard French ends his review of these two books with. He said, what is most remarkable about the creation of Nigeria then is not the logic of its design, which like that of many African countries is hard to see, but that despite the shabbiness and corruption of the post-colonial state, Nigerians who speak 500 or so languages have emerged from this history with a with as strong a collective identity as one can find almost anywhere. What you know about that eyes? What you know about that out What you know about that eye? You know, Nigerians, boy. See, that's how we used to joke. That's how you know African people in the Western Hemisphere. That's how you know 
that so many of us came from what is now called Nigeria. About a third of Africans who made it over across the Atlantic came from the region that is now called Nigeria. Why? Because these are the most, what we not going to do Negroes there are. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So this is what Howard says. He says, among themselves, Nigerians freely and often bitterly lament the shoddiness of their national government, the persistent lack <coughs> of basic services. <coughs> By the way, what Howard is doing here is describing governance, who we are to each other. So let me begin that sentence again. He says, among themselves, Nigerians freely and often bitterly lament the shoddiness of their national government, the persistent lack of basic services such as reliable electricity or clean water, the extravagant displays of corruption by their elites, and the large numbers of people mired in poverty, but encountered overseas or in conversation with other Africans, they exhibit a fierce pride in their shared nationality and a belief in their collective native genius as a people. There were no Nigerians prior to the British invasion. Those two books show you how the British came in and attacked, goes through the history of Usman Danfodio and his attempt to him imposing Islam and creating the so so uh, Sokoto Caliphate. Talks about the South and how they brought Christianity in there and turned them inside out. Talk to any Nigerian with any sense of her or his history and they will tell you Yes, yes, thank you, Karen. Land of the Blacks talks about in both those books. Um, starts say Harry Johnson, the colonization of Africa by alien races. Not Harry Johnson, who was that other fool? Uh, Frederick Lugard, dual mandate in tropical Africa. His wife, Flora Shaw Lugard. John Clark had us reading a tropical dependency, Flora Shaw Lugard's book. Whoo, man, Dr. Clark, man, he would say, You must read a tropical dependency by Flora Shaw Lugard. She was the wife of Frederick Lugard, who the British call Lord Lugard, who is considered the architect of modern Nigeria, one of them colonizers, you understand. His wife wrote a history of Nigeria, beginning with the indigenous people before the British invasion. But if you go to any Nigerian who went to school in Nigeria, they're going to tell you that you leave your indigenous history at the door. We're coming to make you good subjects of the crown. And says, even to this day, they're going to learn the British history. And then like Richard III is somehow their uncle, almost like that. And so that they can turn around and say perhaps one day that they can have some founding fathers like Martin Luther King, who apparently is a founding father of the United States. But the point is this. What that pride, where that pride comes from is a country that didn't exist. They literally drew lines around all these different people, stamped the N-word on them, as, uh, as French explains. As you say, Prof, land of the blacks, Niger, the Niger River, you know, like black, the land of the blacks, which is ironic because, of course, if you want to see literal translation, land of the blacks, you would go to the other side of the continent, Kemet, to Egypt. Kemet literally means black land or land of the blacks, if you're going to use that grammatical point of entry. Um, and then people say, well, they're talking about the richness of the soil. But those who have taken Dr. Beatty's class, who were studying Meta Nature, who will travel with us to Egypt in August, or even if you don't, you've taken that class and you study Meta Nature, you know that when you see the chem, the burnt charcoal piece, and then the uh, phonetic compliments, they're really not phonetic compliments, they're reinforcing the fact that chem is a biliteral KM, and you see the, uh, the owl for M. And then you see the T, the loaf at the end, the determinative, which does not have a sound sign, but a sense sign. The picture then that doesn't convey a sound, but conveys an idea when you see it with a woman and a man, which separately would be people or remetch. When you see it with KMT, Kemet in the glyphs, hieroglyphs is what I'm explaining. Then check out the joke in Theopalo Benga in 1974 at Cairo at the UNESCO meeting on the peopling of ancient Egypt and the deciphering of the Meroitic script. They asked all these white Egyptologists, they said, well, they were talking about the dirt. They said, okay, the land, really? Okay, so you y'all y'all do right, Metanetra, right? These white boys, Egyptologists, got quiet. Why? Because you can see most Egyptologists don't read the glyphs. But Jope and Obinga read the glyphs. And so they in there say, okay, let me draw this for you. Here's Kemet with the land. Okay, yeah. Here's Kemet with the sense sign, the determinative of two people. That mean black people. What that mean to you? Well, it means people from the land that is black. Okay, you can keep turning yourself and we can just move on. Because what we're not going to do is talk to our ancestors through interpreters. As Jacob Carruthers said, African champions must break the chains. Not the chains of slavery, the king, 
that Jonathan Iag wants to start Martin Luther King's history with. Martin King, who himself, when him and Coretta went to Ghana and came back and gave, he gave the talk, Birth of a New Nation, talks about Africa being our home. But that ain't good enough for Jonathan Iag. Why? Because, see, if we don't remember, if our focus is stolen, you can start our history anywhere. Just wait 10 years and you can restart it. Right? You can have a 1619 project and forget that Lorraine of Barone Bennett wrote before the Mayflower. But anyway, that's okay. Because anyway, the point is this. You then would say that creating a we that starts with colonialism, that starts with slavery, then allows for the social structure to continue to anchor how we think about things in a framework that has us coming in at an eternal deficit. We's just glad to be here. And we, if you give us a hamburger and a job, and maybe appoint a couple of us as CEOs or put us on the board, we can work the rest out. No, this whole thing must be remade because we have our own ideas we brought with us. Finally, in this, uh, Howard French says, given the country's size, Nigeria that is, the world must hope that these pull them through. What is that? Their fierce pride and their shared nationality? and a belief in their collective native genius as a people. Is there a collective Nigerian native genius? The Yoruba, the Abibio, the Igbo, the Hausa, the Fulani, all these different groups with different ideas and traditions, different ways of knowing that have some cultural similarity, borrowing again from Sheikh Anta Job, Marimba Ani, so many others that have written about this, Kwame Jeche, uh, the Akan philosopher, Aikwe Arma, so many others that have written about this. Uh, Oyuwanke Oyuwumi, the Yoruba scholar, who says, y'all talking about gender, but you're doing it from the Western lens, which means it's a setup from the beginning. You got to talk about culture differently. Yes, all these cultures differ, but they also have commonalities. Is that enough to form the basis of a common identity when you draw an artificial line around them, whether it be the line around Lagos or the line around Nigeria or South Africa or the line around Memphis? The point is that once you've drawn that line and put them people together, is a fierce pride of being from where they are enough to engender a sense of collective purpose. Howard French says, for the sake of the world, and certainly of Africa, you better hope so for Nigeria, because this setup that was made intentional by the British, drawing these lines around, and then not only drawing the lines around them, but then setting up a system as those two books and so many other scholars of Nigeria have written. Once you've drawn the lines around them, you set them at each other's throats. In the North, you create the idea that the Muslims make better soldiers. So you set them up to work in your militaries, to fight in your militaries. And then when you withdraw, they got the guns and the military formations. And then in the South, you say, we're going to send them to school and make them the people who form the bureaucracy. So among the Yoruba, among the Igbo, you got a lot of bureaucrats, you got a lot of lawyers and doctors and professionals. And then you say, let's have an election. The North doesn't have the oil resources, which you discover, because this is all about the oil. It's all about the resources before that. It's all about the us that you pulled out, because none of you Europeans mean us any good, whether we be in Memphis or in Mauritania, whether we be in Nashville or Nigeria, whether we be in Los Angeles or uh, Lesotho. The point is, you don't mean none of us no good if it means that somehow you feel like you've lost something. This is the tragedy and the criminal center of capitalism, but you keep us at each other's throats in this artificial thing. And what French is saying, even through that, they done figured out a way to even when they're fighting with each other, hold it together a little bit. There have been many lives lost by Afra. There have been many lives lost, Crips versus Blood. There have been many lives lost. So much so that you engender this notion that be able to be myself, I must somehow fight myself in the presence of you. Hence, a boy who's making millions of dollars waving a gun in social media. Why, why you even got that gun in your hand? Because I grew up in a society that said, I must hurt myself in order to protect myself. And by myself, I mean you who look like me. So I'm just letting you know who I am. And meanwhile, these Negroes on television sacrificing the boy, talking about putting him out the league, but they ain't said a damn thing about these owners that are displacing people who ain't got no place to live because somehow the warriors want to move from Oakland to San Francisco. Shut up, every one of you funky commentators. Because you're a minstrel. You're dancing because you want your master to keep your check going. So you want this boy to lose his check, but you don't keep that same energy when it's Marjorie Taylor Greene.
when it's Lauren Bobert. You don't keep that same energy when it's Massey out of Kentucky with his whole damn family on the Christmas tree with AK assault rifles. Keep that same energy or not. Or not. But what we not going to do is listen to you for anything except a cautionary tale, sir. Anything but a cautionary tale. So when we see a Jim Brown, not in 2023. Malcolm X's birthday was yesterday. Uh, it was also the first day that Brittany Griner returned to the court for the Women's National Basketball Association. Perhaps they'll give her a huge enough raise since she ain't going overseas no more, which is the only reason she was over here in the first place. But we know how gender works. Jim Brown has some problematic relationships with women. And they need to be dealt with because he is a figure who we all know because of the platform he was given because he could run a ball. So he becomes then he loses part of his ability to be an anonymous. He then becomes a representative figure. He becomes an icon of sorts. Look at the African studies framework conceptual category called cultural meaning making. How did it do Africans remember a moment in time and space? I'm not old enough. I was a few months old when Jim Brown played his last season for the Cleveland Browns. So I'm not old enough to remember. However, I'm just old enough to remember, like you, Professor Hunter, those black exploitation movies, although it was my cousins who were going to the movies, it took me a little bit longer to see some of them. And like you, I thrilled. I thrilled with Yafet Kato. Across 110th Street. <laughs> I remember the first time I was in Manhattan, right on the edge of Central Park going into Harlem and realized Central Park ends at 110th Street. And in my head, I heard Willie Hutch. Across 110th Street. He talking about Harlem. Across 110th Street is a hell of a test. So I grew up like so many others going in the barber shop where the wallpaper was the jet beauty of the week. I know the problems, but I also know how much we loved. I'm sorry. Let me drop that D. Sorry. How much we love Pam Greer. <laughs> North Carolina. Pam Greer. Complicated. Pam Greer writes in her memoir, as you know, talking about Richard Pryor, who opened us up this morning, talking about Jim Brown and all them drugs that, 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 that Richard Pryor was doing. And Jim Brown came in there and basically chilled him out by not even berating him. Hey, man. <laughs> hey, man. Jim Brown, one of his favorite words. Hey, man. Hey, man. But guess what? Pam Greer said, I was going with Richard Pryor. <laughs> Richard Pryor was doing so much cocaine. We was having sex. I went to the doctor. <laughs> The doctor was like, you got to get off that cocaine. What you talking about? I don't take cocaine. Yeah, well, he's like, that's Rich Brown doing so much cocaine, including all over his private stuff. But he was going up in Pam Greer and getting her high contact. How you get a contact high on powder cocaine? The point is this. We didn't know nothing about Pam Greer. All we knew was coffee. Tamara Dobson. All we knew was Cleopatra Jones. Black exploitation? Okay. Okay. But we're not running to the movies to see. Faye Dunaway and Warren Beatty in Bonnie and Clyde. Yeah, we go see Bonnie and Clyde. We're not going to see uh, Butch Cassidy in the Sunday raindrops falling on my head. Mm -mm. Who's the black private dick who's a sex machine with all the chicks? Shaft! Can you dig it? Mm -mm. Come on now, Isaac Hayes! Ah, the Shaft's a bad mother. Shut your mouth. But I'm talking about Shaft. What does this to say? Then we can dig it. <laughs> now the point is He's a complicated man, and he hates women. He beats up women. That ain't what the lyric says. Isaac Hayes said he's a complicated man, but no one understands him like his woman, John Shaft. Is that black exploitation? I don't know. I don't know. And in the moments when it is black exploitation, as we talked about, a couple of years ago, we talked about the great Curtis Mayfield, who wrote a whole soundtrack critiquing the movie he wrote the soundtrack for. Opens up with Freddie's dead. That's what I said. <laughs> mm. For Superfly. This is a whole movie about drug dealers and revolution 
Can a drug dealer become a revolutionary? What happens when the gangster gets political? If you're watching Godfather of Harlem, which made up a whole relationship between Bumpy Johnson and Malcolm X, and you see Malcolm say and then Bumpy say when the gangster becomes political. Okay, that ain't the first time that's been said. Again, how did or do we remember these moments? Go back to Superfly. This is a, this is a tension at the heart of that film. And Curtis Mayfield is writing on the soundtrack. He says... It's hard to understand there was love in this man. I'm sure I would agree that his misery was his woman and things. Now, Freddie's dead. His misery was his woman and things? Okay, I get to materialism. Is this anti-woman? Mahmoud Abdul Rauf writing about all the relationships in his life from his high school sweetheart all the way through to his final, his last divorce. And he's saying, I came home, all the money was gone. I don't even know what happened to the money. I made the money. We got a joint account. You still couldn't explain to me what happened to the money. Okay, this is life. What Fat Joe saying, lean back. It's a hard world, but this is life. <laughs> Meaning what? Jim Brown's life is public. Jim Brown must be called to account for behavior. And as we all know, if we being honest, this becomes a complicated conversation. Never put your hands on anybody, woman or man. And I'm sure some of y'all, more than just me, know when, you know, gender is not the only indice of who puts their hands on who and who takes that ass with. Either way, we're talking about conflict and how we resolve conflict. So, you know, in Freddie's Dead, Curtis Mayfield goes on to say, you know, we can deal with rockets and dreams, but reality, what does it mean? Don't be misled. Just think of free. What he's doing is giving a materialist critique. Now they over in Hiroshima now where they drop bombs on these people having the G7 summit. China ain't looking the other way. Curtis Mayfield trying to tell you, we can deal with all them rockets and dreams. A generation later, Prince says, you know, it's silly, you know, when a rocket ship explodes and everybody still wants to fly. In other words, y'all can deal with rockets and dreams. It's, you know, you still want to go to space, but the people on the earth are suffering. And when Mahmoud Abdul Raouf stands up and does like this, because the black coast and told him they got to make you get up because they want you to stay, even though there ain't no rule except nigga, get up. He said, I'm praying for those who have been oppressed by this who have found themselves to be victims of this. When Jim Brown says, I'm not going to let you treat me any kind of way, and my brother has decided he's not going to Vietnam, so I'm going to sit and we're going to listen to him, and then we're going to stand up and support him. And while we're doing this, we're going to build this independent Black economic base to work from that you really don't want to cover. Why? Because you want to see me on the field. You want to ask me why I came to work in a suit. You came to work in a suit. The whole theory of black self-determination is an attempt to create a we in the governance formation. That's what they're doing in Nigeria. That's what uh, Howard French is talking about. That's what uh, this dude, mm -mm -mm, what did I do with the book on Nelson and Winnie? Um, that's what, uh, I don't need it. I just keep moving stuff around and you know I'm going to obsess until I see it. So if I don't see it in the next couple of minutes because um mm -mm -mm. And yeah, yeah, I know how it works. You know how it works. Here it is. Nelson and Winnie, Portrait of a Marriage. Caught my eye because that's the title. And of course, he's starting. <laughs> he's starting. This is where I wanted to go today, but I'm not, so not going to spend much my, my time on it. I've only read about maybe 30% of the book. Johnny Steinberg. He's talking about their relationship. And he's doing an excellent job of combing new materials and interviewing everybody who knew them. So there's a lot of information in here. The framework, of course, is worthless because it's a social structure framework because it has to be. It has to be. I'm not mad at the guy because I didn't have any expectations of him. But in South Africa, like Nigeria, you've created a country. But unlike Nigeria, which is a point that Steinberg makes, excellent point he makes, in, in South Africa, the Europeans came and stayed, the Afrikaners and the British. So in 1948, when the Afrikaner government creates what we now know as apartheid, those laws, by then Nelson Mandela, who is by then in his 20s, is starting the ANC Youth League. There's tensions there. And at the heart of these tensions is the idea of 
a free South Africa, but not a free South Africa in the same vision as you would have a free Nigeria or a free Ghana, you understand, or free Egypt, or United Arab Republic, however you want to call it, which I don't even get into that. Maybe we talk about this uh, on Office Hours Monday night. When it's in my mind, I'm not going to say it because I want to stay focused on this as we kind of wind this up for the day. You're not going to have in South Africa the same thing you have in most of these other countries because the whites have come and stayed. So you're literally creating something that didn't exist before. South Africa has more in common in that sense than you, that with the United States in terms of a settler state. But instead of the indigenous people of the Western Hemisphere, the so-called Indians who were decimated, in South Africa, the indigenous people continued and they're still the overwhelming majority. And what Steinberg gets into, I think largely because he is a European, but then again, who knows? Again, I'm, you know, I give everybody the benefit of the doubt because I'm extracting what I need from it. The framework, that's why in the African States framework, you got to ask the right questions. If you ask the right questions, whatever you come up with, even if it doesn't add up, they're your questions. What he's raising is this possibility that Nelson Mandela and so many others who were in the leadership, Walter Sisulu and Oliver Tambo and so many others, these young people who are coming up. They're fighting this cat named Nda, MDA, who is saying, we don't, we're going to have self-determination on African terms. I don't want white leadership. I don't want colored leadership, meaning Indians like Gandhi and all them. In this defiance campaign in the 1950s, because I think that we should be as Africans at the front of our struggle because it's our country. But what they realize is these white people are not going home. These are the ancestors of uh, Sharice Theron and them, who will call herself an African. They ain't going home. They invaded, they here. So we got to come up with a different concept. And of course, now they call South Africa the Rainbow Nation. But what Steinberg begins to speculate is a lot of these Africans who went to school, a lot of these Africans who become part of leadership, Nelson Mandela is the first continental African to be in his class at the law school at the University of Eswatini, Vitz. He doesn't graduate. He stays there six, seven years because they try to put him up out. This man who came out of Kunu, and well, he won't get into his biography. My point is this. What Steinberg speculates is some of these black people, they definitely want rights. They definitely want an independent South Africa. Nelson Mandela even goes so far as a young man say, I want to be president of South Africa. Yeah, this dude is crazy. But they like being around these white people. And underneath it, they might want white approval. They like going over to Joe and Jillian Slovo's house in the Joburg suburbs and sitting around with white people talking and smoking and eating or going next door to the white people who live there who are members of the Communist Party of South Africa, which has white leadership. And they got a pool and switching out for their swim trunks and laying up next to white girls eating peanuts. That's a direct quote. The whole point is they like this proximity to whiteness. They don't want to give up being black, but there's something underneath that. So when you see a Jim Brown coming back across the water, whose ancestors came through enslavement, but whose ancestors in them sea islands retained direct Africanisms and were sequestered from the poisonous influence of white supremacy as a penetrating cultural logic. You see somebody who is like, I'm not looking to you for my culture. If I kiss a white girl, it's because I'm in the mood. And I'm going to kiss her on the movies. Mm. And I'm not Harry Belafonte who touched Petula Clark and y'all put him off TV. You know? I don't give a damn. I quit my, I was the best football player in the history of football and I walked away. You think I'm going to let y'all cancel me because uh, because I touched a white girl? Hey, Hammer, ain't you making movies now? And then Fast forward a generation, movement and memory. How does that even reinforced? How is that even reinforced? When Keenan Ivory Wayans reaches out for them, and I'm going to get you sucker. Prof, why did he do that? Why did Keenan Ivory Wayans for a new generation kind of give a glimpse of how his generation idolized Pam Greer and Bernie Casey and Jim Brown and Fred Williamson? <laughs> and uh, what's you, you named him uh, the Kung Fu guy. I say Kung Fu. Uh, Jim, Kelly. Jim Kelly. Oh my God, with that afro. What are we talking about? And the Bandung world, the non aligned movement world, people who were with them. Of course, the whole relationship between Kareem Abdul Jabbar and Bruce Lee. The whole point is that we not, what we're not going to do is look to white people in the world. But why, why do you think Keenan Wayans brought them into I'm going to get you sucker? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Which is a satire. Yeah, I'm. I'm hoping is so that we don't forget. It's part of what we do every 
Saturday, right? That we we got to sew in and weave in what when when Summer Walker sounds like Erica Badu because she sat at Erica Badu's feet and everybody is talking about she's trying to sound like yes she is trying to sound like Erica Badu and what's wrong with that yes because we got to bring it forward to the next generation to the next generation we have to retain all of that when when uh, Lauren Hill makes a nod to Nina Simone defecating on a microphone we get we got to then forward right like this is this is what we must do this is what we do every saturday it's what we must do and when you hear her and you hear aretha and a rose is still a rose baby girl you got the power and looping in lauren hill what i am is what i am yes it's just exactly of course it's what he did and people are saying in the chat absolutely said when we look in the mirror uh, we should always ask ourselves, Kay Kennedy says, that's what we should ask in the mirror every morning. What you going to do? <laughs> what you going to do? When in that scene, when um, Kena Ivory Wayans is talking to Bernie Casey and every time they show up, you got all that music playing. Bop, 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 bop. What is that? What is that? Bernie Casey says my theme music. Every good hero should have some. Right. <laughs> in other words, then you, then you get a menstrual football coach. Oh. <sighs> Take your time. Come on, prof. Come on back. We, we, about, we, we about to turn for home. Well, come on now. Come on. This, look, Jim Brown, we wish you as you ascend. It's going to be a minute before you become an ancestor and stand up. We're going to feed you on the way over there, brother. But go ahead. This, this, he, he made the way for this this morning. <laughs> I think the frustration is you, you, you parrot things that you don't know. Right. Where's my theme music? But you going over to Colorado saying that now what that has nothing to do with them. Why? Why are you bringing that into, you know, we, we were um, talking about this space that we've created in Nubian narrative, and it absolutely centers nothing but the study of Africana ways of knowing. That's right. And whoever comes in, this is you just going to have to, you know, I don't care where you come from. Everybody's welcome. But right. what we are, what we're not going to do not is center you. We're yeah. centering us before mm -hmm. so that we can remember so that we can repair this, as you call it, this funky uh, thing that we're in right yeah. now. It is funky. It's very smelly. Um, you know, but as I respond, unfortunately, we are the only ones with the tools to repair. It. We're the only ones with the skills to repair. It. So we have to repair ourselves first. So uh, this is every, every day, you know, the 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 assignment, right? Every get right, get right with yourself, and then get right with us. Get right with the community. What you gonna do? What you gonna do? Yeah. And if we keep asking that question, and I think that's part of the genius of that clip that you shared with us from uh, Richard Pryor. What is Jim Brown saying? You got good sense. Your grandma, I know your history. What you gonna do? I don't need to tell you not what you gonna do, man. Come on, you wanna play a game? No, but let me get you out of this stress. Let me get you out of it. What you gonna do? <laughs> and after a while, it's like, okay, man, I can't run from myself. This is why Aisha Amani used to always tell us, the master teacher, she'd say, you know, to young people, let's all be quiet. And invariably, somebody would start making some noise. She said, see, the most difficult thing for you to be is with yourself because you're not alone. Every ancestor we ever had, no one that shows you where I am, my ancestors, they're all with us. Jim Brown carried them Gullah Geechee and he carried their ancestors and he carried their and you're not going to start our history with slaves, whether it's Jonathan I, Johnny Steinberg, any damn body else. We went through enslavement and we hear. And you know that when we reconnect with that, it's over for you. It doesn't mean we're going to kill all of y'all, but it does mean what we're not going to do is make our memory your memory. See, the Nigeria is a new place, but it's a new place founded on some very old people. Mm. And, and and that's true for us, too. We only kill ourselves. And I'm glad you mentioned reparations. We only kill ourselves by starting our history with slavery. You've now cut yourself off. Now, is the history since slave during and since slavery powerful? Absolutely. But Dan Black always reminds us you came here from somewhere and that's what sustains you. Again, movement and memory, ways of knowing. And, and so finally, these obituaries that will have Jim Brown talk about his life as an athlete. Syracuse and lacrosse. One of the Jim Brown biographies, and I forget the guy. Uh, uh, I wish I could remember the guy. Mike Freeman. Mike Freeman. Jim Brown. His book on Jim Brown, which is excellent. He interviewed a lot of people, but his framework is useless, of course. Which, of course, because I don't expect him to have it. But 
he starts the first, if memory serves me correctly, there's a quote from someone who played lacrosse with Jim Brown. And the quote is like, Jim Brown was like a Greek god with dark skin. <laughs> now, I ain't mad at that guy. He's a white man. He thinks that's a compliment. He doesn't know. I doubt he took Greek at Syracuse or anywhere before or since. So he doesn't know that Ethiopia, the root of the word Ethiopian, literally in Greek is their word, the phrase they call burnt face. <laughs> so to call somebody a Greek guard with dark skin, two things happen. Number two, you call them Ethiopian, which ain't an insult. And number one, when you go back and read the Iliad and the Odyssey, the collective poets who is la are labeled Homer, you understand that uh, the, the Iliad begins with the Greek gods coming back from Ethiopia where they've gone home to feast. So you really don't even know you're paying a compliment, but the compliment you think you're paying is actually not a compliment. The compliment you are paying is really so deep that makes you understand that Jim Brown is your grandfather while he out there with that Native American stick whipping your ass before he goes and plays football. But the, the, the obituaries are going to deal, the social structure obituary is going to deal with him as an athlete, then they're going to deal with him, you know, bucking and going to the movies and being an activist. And then they'll trace him all the way through with some, you know, stipulated moments. And then they'll bring up, you know, the violence and bring up the controversy. And, and that'll be it. What we have to do, if we can manage it, is think about him. And, and I pull from the shelf one of our great elders, the great uh, Mariba Kelsey, um, two of his books. Do you want liberal? So you want liberation. Understanding African Senate Principles for Life and his most recent book, Strengthening African Senate Organizations, 11 Keys. There's Baba Kelsey. Soon to celebrate this summer, his 98th birthday. Uh, shout out to his grandson, Hanif, who just graduated from high school. He's headed to Florida Agricultural and Mechanical in the fall. But Baba Mariba reminds me that there are it reminds us that there are stages of life. You've got youth, then you've got young adulthood and adulthood, and you've got elderhood. When you reach a certain stage at the end of young adulthood, you're in now your 30s and 40s through your 50s, mid 50s. That's the stage that uh, Dr. Kelsey would call the nation building stage. What we saw in the life of Jim Brown was an active nation building stage as a person who is no longer a child, who is no longer a very young adult. But has reached this era where I've got a little money, I've got a little resources, I've got connections, I've got some visibility. What do I do with it? That's the nation building stage. So on Oprah's hours on Monday night, when the young sister says she's going to finish her dissertation on Tuesday and got that love, oh my God, that love was so powerful. Why? Because you're talking to people who have done it. And when you're talking to people who have done it, then you understand. Uh, and, and Dr. Austin, Tasha Austin, who's up there in Buffalo, you know, in the chat, some his sister said, you know, I just I'm, I'm finishing my dissertation. I got I'm defending my dissertation tomorrow. Yes. All universities, all formal education institutions in our space are on the periphery. Now, this is the center. It is no uh, uh, respecter of degrees or where you went to school, how much money you got. No, we're all in here together. And then out of that, we go into these spaces and use what we can to either help transform them or bring them back, bring resources back to the center. That was intergenerational. That was two nation builders talking to each other. Come on, sis. We got you. You got this. And then she spoke life into that sister. So here we are on Saturday, May 20th. That happened on Tuesday. The distaste defense, she's done. She was done before she walked in the room, as Tasha told her. They don't even schedule the defense unless it's a wrap. That I'm sure that took a burden off. Nobody had to tell us that because we had people bringing us through. But what Baba Mariba says, then you reach elder stage. So after the insurrections in Los Angeles and around the country in 1992, Jim Brown said, come to my house. Because the Crips and the Blood said they're going to squash. And if you heard the Chronic album, Dr. Dre, then you heard that on the day the N-words took over. You hear the, you know, Dre laces in footage or sound from footage of what was going on in South Central during that period. And you hear the brother say, if you ain't down for the Africans, if you ain't down for these Mexicans, if you ain't down, then get out of the way. And then and then you hear him lace in, break them off something, break them off something. And you hear them say that, right? And then Jim Brown bring them all over his house. And who's there too? And one of them means the Sparecon, Ice Cube, all them there. Then they had a summit in Chicago. All this being covered in the final call. Now, 
there will be academics, Negro and others, who will write about that and either try to shoehorn it into democracy eh, or critique it as a patriarchal undertow. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, we got these brothers out here performing hyper-masculinity, killing each other and wrecking stuff. On the, so you're not proposing that women start doing it, right? Because if you spent any time in K-12 over the last 20 years, and I saw it firsthand when I was working in, in schools in Philly in the 90s and have seen it ever since even more so. You going to school now? Prof, I know you've heard this or seen it yourself. Who is the main ones fighting in the schools? It's the girls. You go, you go in the, you go in the, <laughs> in the schools, and who is in here? Knock if you buck. It ain't the dudes. <laughs> These girls in here. I'm talking about. Look, man. I remember one time I went to high, I went to middle school, a middle school like this is like '99. I won't name the school. I mean, I walked in just as they had broken up, a huge fight. I'm talking about dozens of girls. And the girls was beating up boys. They was beating up each other in the middle school. And I'm like, <laughs> so, so how do you solve that? Angela Davis meeting with Ice Cube. Yeah, Jeff Chang writes about it and, and Can't Stop, Won't Stop. It's history of hip hop. You know, Angela Davis is pushing Ice Cube on this question of patriarchy. And she's saying, you know, when you start talking about the black man and all, because he's basically taking a page from the Nation of Islam. And Ice Cube says, well, I'm talking about everybody. I'm not just talking about women. She said, but yeah, but you didn't say women. That's a legitimate and that's an important thing to engage. But what we're not going to do is bring in all these other people to come in and say, well, here's what I think. We don't care what you think. Not right now. As I told him at Duke years ago when I went down there to give a talk on African States, I was like, I named my story, my, my talk after Tevin Campbell's song. I said, I'm here to talk with you all, but only just for a second. So the name of my talk was African States. Can we talk for a minute? <laughs> for a minute. <laughs> I need to know your name. I want to know your name. And then I'm going back to my house. Why? Because see, the problem we have is we don't have a house that we have gotten in order from which to launch. You can't talk about reparations until you've dealt with this question, as you say, of internal issues internal challenges. So yes, we got to deal with patriarchy. Yes, we got to deal with classes. We got to deal with all that. What are the tools we're deriving? We're not going to import tools from other places. Not until and unless we have first engaged ourselves, until we have looked ourselves in the mirror and said, what are you going to do? So yeah, this, the obituary is going to deal with him as an athlete. They're going to deal with him as a celebrity. They're going to deal with him in the movies. They're going to deal with some of his activism. They're going to call him an activist. But we have to see him as a nation builder. His youth, his youth years, how he was raised, his nation building years, and then his elder years, which has which stretched on blessfully. Dr. Kelsey would say your elder years start somewhere in your mid 50s and continue to make transition. By that, by that characterization, this man spent three plus decades as an elder and he didn't shrink and he went places a lot of us wouldn't go. But, and, maybe, and maybe shouldn't go. But and maybe shouldn't go. And I thank you, Prof, because this also brings us, this is a good place to bring us to a close. Because as I said, Brittany Griner played last night. They released an article in Time magazine that said, why Brittany Griner will stand for the national anthem. Y'all still on that shit? I saw that. I saw that. Did you see that? Now that. Here, here my mood, Raouf, is you crucify him and, then, and then act like he never existed. Craig Hodgman. So what do you think? Of it? I mean, this is what they do. This is what a social trade. You will bow. <laughs> and look, she's just so happy to be home. Right. And happy to be paid right now and happy to be at the center because you, you she now everywhere, right? Being feeded everywhere, having having, you know, award ceremonies in every place. So so I and I hate this structure for putting people in that position. Right. What is she going to do? What's she gonna do, Prof? What Say, is she gonna do? I ain't really, you know. So, so you you are forcing this 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 flag thing on somebody who is grateful to be home. Thank right. you. Unless, unless, Child. unless everybody say she could do what she want, but they ain't gonna do that. Nah. See, this is what happens when you don't have movement and memory. When you don't gain yourself the advantage of movement and memory, the minute. They asked her, you're going to stand for the anthem? She should have been able to get on the phone, 
Call Cheryl Swoops and Lisa Leslie. Yeah. Call Candace Parker. Go back and, and get Teresa Edwards. And not just them. Dawn Staley. Just, Dawn Staley. And not just them. Call LeBron. Call Kareem. Yeah. Call, in fact, call Kareem first. first. Yes. Like Kareem. You was the young boy. This boy was at University of California at Los Angeles. This was the young boy. This is one of the reasons he's still here. This man was not yet a professional athlete. Do you understand what was on the line? Why that little that little uh that little white nationalist adjacent uh now national champion uh whatever little name is out there from Louisiana State University. Hey, don't, that, don't give it, don't give up like don't no, give I'm not. but but the point is you didn't cape for this woman when she was overseas trapped you didn't cape for her and now because why because you got a new n-word who's naked in uh sports yeah. illustrated swim shirt issue swimsuit issue so you want to talk about patriarchy do you really want to have this conversation in this funky criminal enterprise look when people when black people say now do jim brown did it. yes now do everybody else now that don't mean that you let Jim Brown off the hook. What we are saying, you got to apply our ways of knowing. What you are saying is out of our grappling, what we not going to do is pretend as if you are somehow off the hook and the source for a great deal of this. You're not the source of all of it. A lot of this is human beings grappling whatever culture traditions we have. But what we not going to do is let you continue. So yeah, they ask her, you're right, prop. What the hell was she going to do? What did she? So I'm standing because I'm standing with people. Why you got to dance like this? And Brett Favre ass Come on. is around here with his Negro enabler running around try, talking about Trump. Hey man, you can look, do what you want, bro. Do what you want. You play for the Green Bay Packers. Now at a banquet, you'll kiss Willie Davis behind. But Willie Davis in this picture right here. And guess what? While you down there getting money that need to be going to poor people, many of whom look just like you hmm. and looking for excuses, you played for a franchise where the brothers who was on there in one of the most segregated parts of the country, not behind the cotton curtain, but ask them people in Milwaukee. We got sisters and brothers in here, including the sister who's who works in the plumbing industry, who's her master plumber there in Milwaukee, who comes into office hours. Ask them about how segregated Milwaukee is. And so this man was in Green Bay and stood with them and was part of this initiative. But Brett Favre, you got an initiative you're part of too. It's called White Supremacy in the United States of America and the state of Mississippi. So no, of course we wouldn't expect Brittany Griner to do anything else. But before we let her off, before we let her off by saying, well, she's young. Was she younger than Kareem Abdul-Jabbar? And guess what? If she don't want to stand, she should continue to have a career. You shouldn't be able to do her like Mahmoud abdul Raou. You shouldn't be able to do her like Colin Kaepernick. You shouldn't be able to do her like that. But the reason you can is because of us, not because of y'all. We know who you are. So what we going to do? That's a good place to end. Mm. What we going to do? That's what Jim Brown asked. Oh, by, by the way, I should, I should mention one other thing. I'm going to be next week. This is where I was going to prep for this week. But next week, I'm looking forward to this. And this is, again, this is very quick. Next week, we'll be in uh, Ohio at Wilberforce. Uh, Baba Larry Crow, who's probably here this morning, he and Mama Ola BC. Uh, they are part of the collective along with the Association for the Study of Classical African Civilizations and our friends at the National Afro-American Museum and Center, Center and Museum, which is the first national Afro-American museum named that in Wilberforce, opened in 1976, literally on the campus of Wilberforce University. We're there for the Martin Delaney Symposium. So that's Memorial Day weekend. So we start talking about a nation in a nation. Those of you who are in Nubia, who are narrative, of course, in narrative, you got to be in narrative to be in Nubia. Go into narrative, go into archive, look at the Martin Laney conversations we had because this uh, common Saturday will be uh, live from, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and if you're at the Preakness today, <laughs> the, the Preakness runs today, right, Pra? I don't, I, I probably, you're a triple crown, right? The only reason I'm mentioning it is I'm not, I'm not, in, I'm not dialed into it at well, all. The only reason I'm raising it is because Pimlico, don't go anywhere, but Pimlico, the racetrack is in the hood. So is the Kentucky Derby. Exactly. Exactly. But watch this. This is why I love like do y'all think voting don't matter? It's very interesting. They are fighting now over about four hundred million dollars, and they got to figure out where they're gonna are they gonna take 
the Preakness from where it's almost always been run because black people make a lot of money, people park and this kind of thing. Or are they going to move it? There's a place called Laurel Park where the, the private company that owns all that, they're going to maybe move that in Anne Arundel County. But Wes Moore is the governor. The oh, stadium wow. authority board of directors has changed. He's appointed two new people in the chair. The chair, Craig Thompson, is a lawyer. He did his, his, his undergrad degree at University of Maryland in African-American studies. He's got his JD. And now he's the chair of the Stadium Authority Board of Directors. They're going to decide where the thing go. Please, y'all, please understand their voting matters. Anyway, I just want to mention that. So if you're going to the damn Preakness, if you're black, get all their money because they leave the hood after they run that race and the second leg of the Triple Crown. But just know that you want people in positions to be able to intervene because $400 million is being argued over now and they may take it from the hood. Mm. And, and as we sit there, April, long time ago in the chat in Nubia, mm. as you're holding up the picture, people are asking who the guy was who's hidden. Did she find uh, No, we no, I, we still don't know. Um, maybe somebody knows, but I didn't see it in the chat. But she, she raised the question, we need to convene a meeting like that today. And I was like, well, who would convene it? Like, I, you know, do we, you know, to, to that point with Brittany Griner, like, yes. where can she go? Who? Who's out there that's not chasing uh, the the pick me syndrome or the check to to make sure that their their bag is protected? Like who is gonna put everything on the line? Like all those brothers put everything on the line. Some lost their jobs. Where is that today? Besides, who would it be, who, who would it be Prof? I mean, set aside yeah. the politics and just think about the the status. Jim Brown is the best football yeah. player in professional right. football when he does that. Who is that best football player? Yeah. In that? Jalen, Jalen, it, it would have to be someone like a Jalen Hurt, right? That's the other thing. There's not a one or so in, in basketball, I guess it would be LeBron. LeBron. And, and, I, and, we, and we remember what happened in the bubble when he called Obama and Obama did what he's supposed to do as the president of the United States. Hey, hey, just play, man. Y'all can figure out. In other words, he, so Jim Brown is not somebody who would have called Barack Obama if the Barack Obama would have been around. Right. So who would, it, I guess it would have to be a star like that. But well, I should admit, when uh, like who I, I don't know the, the point is probably nobody this is this is the, the the vacuum the void even even your you know even the folk that are supposed to be in the position someone said Ben Chavis maybe maybe Ben Chavis ben I don't Chavis know. Couldn't do that Ben Chavis would go but why I mean Ben Chavis in fact remember it's so funny somebody mentioned Ben Chavis y'all some of y'all remember when this thing went down in LA and then people were trying to get these brothers to stop fighting each other. Jim Brown come over his house. Of course, Amir Khan comes out of that. You know, fair kind of them. Ben Chavis was over the NAACP. He went to Detroit and met with the Black Nationals. And then he met with the Crips and the Bruds. At that point, the NAACP leadership is like, hold on, man. That's when the class tension yeah. came out. Now, you, know, the other you know he's founded by white people. Stop playing. Stop playing, bro, because you're going to mess up our money. This is very, and, and in fact, but Abdul, Abdul Rauf writes about traveling after he converted. He didn't say convert. He calls it reverted. He says in Islam, we call it reverted. We're going back to what we were doing. Right. Because most of the Africans brought here were of the Islamic faith. Well, many of them, if they if they were, if they, they certainly weren't Christians. If they, they either believed in their indigenous right. thing or they were Muslims, right. right. And so, but what he says is people started suggesting books to me. And so I started reading them. He said, I made Hajj, but I only heard about Hajj from reading the autobiography of Malcolm X. And so what I'm saying is that he said, when they started asking me about why I didn't stand, what they did, he said, Bernie Bickerstaff said, you're creating dissent among your teammates. He said, no, I wasn't. We be reading books. I be giving them books. We be having conversations. Nobody here is having a problem with this. You having a problem with it. Why are you scared? What you scared of? I'm raising that to say that who would do it today when people open their mouth? You know what? I'll tell you who might. Oh, I'll tell you who might. One of the brothers who wrote on the back of this is a blurb, Jalen Brown. Jalen Brown is an interesting dude. He said, I'm not really watching. Wait, from this. Austin? Yeah, he's interesting. Jalen Brown reads. You hear Jalen Brown? He don't always go along. I'm not saying he's, he's not big enough. So he's not Jordan. He's not Jordan. So it would have to be on the level of Jim Brown, who's the greatest. Muhammad Ali, the greatest. Bill Russell, the 11 time champion. You know, uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the greatest at that time college basketball player. It would have to be somebody that big. Jalen Brown's not there yet. Maybe he will be. I mean, it would be like Steph Curry with, you know, if he stepped in, LeBron, Steph. Um, those are only two that I think would have the cachet. Uh, uh, well, well, JT or 
let's continue this in office hours. The reason yeah, I say is that. because well, the reason I say is because last Monday, for those of you not in office hours, you're watching this uh, on another venue. We I played a little clip from Tony Montero's remarks at the sixth uh, Malcolm X Symposium, yeah. Professor Montero. And what he said is the Philadelphia where Malcolm X came as a young man, worked as a longshoreman, opened Temple Number 12 for the nation. That Philadelphia doesn't exist anymore. And he read it through a very materialist reading. He said, you know, people are not working. This is some, a whole nother universe. We had to pick this up another time. But the idea is that the working class has been decimated. The laboring classes, as, 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 as James Turner talks about, it. these superstar athletes today are evidence of increasing inequality. Jim Brown and them, a lot of them had to get jobs in all season. Yeah. They're not making that kind of money. When yeah. you have this type of extreme inequality, the, you, we can't, in some ways, we can compare LeBron James to a Jim Brown. In other ways, we can't. Right. The world that Jim Brown opposed, the world that Althea Gibson opposed, the, the world that they opposed doesn't exist anymore. Even Harry Belafonte, because he was working absolutely. as a man, as a presentation person while he was acting. You know, like, yeah, yeah, no, I think you're absolutely that, right. Probably, we, should, we should end with that because what you just said, I think you've given us the framework we have to be serious about. As these long distance runners make transition, we need to study their lives for how, as they lived through these various stages and reached elderhood, they engaged with young people to help them understand. No, it's not the same, but these things remain the same. That's why we pause for these elders. Because and they are so yeah. far removed from the struggle. That's right. You, know, you, That's you, get, right. you talk about LeBron, you go from AAU basketball to superstardom, Hummer in high school, rich been rich for you know 20 years of his life like right you know it's a, it's a, a different you can you can be from akron but he ain't been from akron in a while you know in a while in a while in a while Nation of you know somebody that gives back but yeah oh wait um, well thank you ray you ray has put in the chat and this is where everybody's watching if you're watching this today on saturday the east uh, the e c b a c c which is the east coast uh black comics the east coast uh black age of comics convention is free all day today at Temple University. So if you're in Philly at Temple, go by the, because I, I used to go all the time. This is where the black creatives are. The black writers, the black comics, the black independent artists. So Uraeus has put that in there. Another thing is if you're in DC area, DMV, at right, one o'clock today, one to six, on the campus of Howard University, Blackburn Auditorium, it too is free. There's uh, Mahmoud Abdul Rauf is actually going to be there. That's one of the reasons I read his uh, memoir. He's going to uh, It's called in the blink of an eye, an autobiography. My oh, with the child. Life. Shout out to uh, Deneen Milner's husband. Oh, go ahead now. You know, I'm glad, I'm glad you made me put this up. So, of course, and Howard Bryan's forward. Howard Bryan, yes. It's all, a beautiful forward. All peoples. Yes, all them people. is your people. No question. And that's going to be today at one. So if you're around, uh, if you're in Philly, certainly go by the uh, the, the, the East Coast uh, comics. And if you're in D.C., come by and say hello to the brother because they're going to show a little bit of the documentary they did and he's going to be signing copies of his book. All right. Well, listen, um, I figured uh, since yesterday was his birthday, we should listen to the words of Malcolm X. Since we started with Richard Pryor talking about uh, <laughs> being visited by his friend and James Brown, Jim Brown asking him, you know, if you want our friendship, we, you know, like he put the friendship on the line. I'm here as a friend. Yes. Um, there's a clip of Malcolm yes. talking about the difference between being friendly and being a friend. So I want to play that mm. as well. But um. Everyone have a wonderful uh, rest of your weekend. Dr. Carr, God bless you. I love you. I love you too. Uh, see you in them Nubian streets and all mm -hmm. of the Nubians as well. And if you're on YouTube, uh, hit the like button, subscribe. Yeah. Would y'all uh, do that, please? And if you comment, comment with some good damn sense or you'll be blocked. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. All right, let's play this. But being friendly and being a friend, I think, are two different things. I think there are many whites who act friendly toward Negroes. A fox acts acts friendly toward the lamb. Mm -hmm. And usually the fox is the one who ends up with the lamb chop on his plate. Mm -hmm. The wolf doesn't act friendly. And therefore the wolf has more difficulty in getting the lamb chop in his plate. I'd like to point out though that- and I, I, I say that because it is usually the, if you study the structure of the Negro community, mm -hmm. economically, politically, civically, psychologically and otherwise, it's controlled by the white liberal mm -hmm. who usually poses as the friend of the Negro, who actually differs from the white conservative in, in the same way that the fox differs from the wolf. Uh, their appetite is the same. Their motives are the same. It's only their 
mannerisms and, and methods that differ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.